have Zeke training that you present and you would like for us to review it so that it, it gets um, Zeke approved status. So that would be something that the Zeke LT and the project endorses. If you'd like to submit that, pay attention next week. I have some blog posts coming out on how you can do that. And likewise, if you would like to help Richard and I with the newsletter, please let us know. We try to do those every month. It ends up being about every six weeks, but um, we would like input on that. So we do have a news channel and the Zeke Slack as well. So again, thank you to all of our trainers and our participants for day one and day two. And now we'll get started with day three and our developer and, uh, and Zeke roadmap track. And with that, Richard, I'll let you introduce yourself because I could spend 10 minutes just introducing you. So I'll let you tell folks a little bit about what you want them to know about and say thank you so much for agreeing to keynote today. Sure. Well, thank you, Amber. And yeah, I'd like to thank you, Amber, for all the work you've done to organize this conference. And I'd like to uh, thank the, the Zeke LT for giving me the opportunity to speak and also to uh, my boss, uh, Greg, for all the support he's given. And uh, as you can see, this is one of my cats here. He's going to actually be doing the presentation today. Uh, this is Brady. My other cat's name is Gronk. And yes, they are named after uh, Tom Brady and Rob Gronkowski from the Patriots, who neither of I, I grew up in Massachusetts. So that's where, <laughs> that's where my allegiances lie, even though they now play for, uh, for Tampa Bay. But uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to be speaking today. I'd just like to say from the outset, um, it has never been, or there's never been a better time to be involved with Zeke and the uh, open source community. Uh, I think we're just going from strength to strength. And uh, it's just been so amazing to see uh, the work that's been done in the last few years. And you know, Amber has been a big part of that, getting us all organized and, and adding these, these new capabilities. And also uh, with that, I'm happy to start my keynote. Um, it's called Thoughts on Zeek and Network Screen Monitoring in the 2020s. And I have to say, when I when I took a look at that title that I put there and I saw 2020s, I thought, oh my goodness. And that sort of made me remember the, uh, the introduction to the Buck Rogers in, the, in the, the 25th Century show, which aired in 1979. So when I was watching this, I was, I think, about seven years old. And the show began with uh, the Orson Welles reading uh, something like, uh, the year is 1987 and America launches the last of its deep space probes. So to think that back then in 1979, you know, 1987 was considered the future and we'd be launching the last of our deep space probes. And here we are in the 2020s and we're still doing network security monitoring. Uh, yeah, I started in uh, my first, yeah, I basically saw my first network traffic and packets in 1997. Uh, first got my real operational mission around it in 1998. And uh, to think that we're, you know, we're still doing this, I'm still doing this so many years later is, uh, is really something else. So with that, uh, just what I'll be looking at today, um, we're going to do a little bit of a, a level set of where we are in 2021. And then I'm going to talk about the uh, four types of network security monitoring data, the three natures of NSM. Uh, I'm going to have some advice for people who are designing interfaces to NSM data. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude with a, just a little bit about taking care of yourself and uh, Zeke in action. So I hope uh, my goal with this presentation was to have something for the different types of people who would be in the audience, uh, whether you're a developer or a user or an analyst or you know whatever your, your situation may be. Okay, so I wanted to start uh, with one of my favorite sources of information about the state of security. Uh, prior to, oh, I didn't even say who I was or what I, where I came from. Well, this, this is a good prompt for that. Uh, so I, my name is Richard Baitlick and I work at Corelight. I've been here now over three years. Prior to that, I was uh, the first CISO at Mandiant, and then I stayed through the acquisition by FireEye. Uh, prior to that, I was the first director of incident response for General Electric, and I built the GE cert. Uh, prior to that, I was uh, uh, in Kevin Mandia's first incident response team when we were together at Foundstone. I also did some uh, support to offensive work for the government as a contractor at Mantech. And I began my career in uh, the 90s as an Air Force intelligence officer. I was a captain in the Air Force uh, CERT at Air Intelligence Agency. But to bring us back to Mandy and the M-Trans, um, I think a lot of us sort of wonder if we're making any difference in security, if we're making any progress. And the M-Trans report has been going on now for many years. And it's one of the few places that has a set of metrics that are uh, repeated each year. So you can look for trends in those uh, M-Trends as they're called. 
And the 2021 report, which looks back at calendar year 2020 and earlier, is the report that I'll be citing here. Uh, so the first bit of metrics that I wanted to share was the uh, global median dwell time. And what dwell time is, is the, as you can see in the little definition to the left, it's essentially a measurement of the amount of time that an intruder spends in an environment prior to being discovered and then launching some type of incident uh, response and remediation. And back when I started at Mandiant, I actually joined Mandiant in 2011, the, uh, the global median dwell time was 416 days. So over a year, intruders were, were dwelling within a victim before there was any type of detection and response, which was clearly ridiculous. Uh, but as you can see over the year, or I should say over the years, this number has been steadily declining. Um, we had one year, 2017, where there was a bump, but then after that, it's been, it's been going down. Um, now, in 2015, another set of metrics uh, was in, were, appeared, and these metrics had to do with what was the dwell time if you found out from someone else that you had an intrusion versus what was the dwell time if you found it yourself. Um, so this is one of the few metrics where you can look at and say, wow, things appear to be getting better. We are, uh, intruders are spending less time uh, unopposed within a victim environment. Now, I know that some of you who are observant are going to say, well, wait a second, didn't something happen in the last few years that might have caused this compromise notification number to drop in not a good way? And, and we will get to that. The other number that has been sort of interesting over the years is, is detection by source. And this number, you would hope, would be driven by internal detections. So if you think about the types of cases that Mandian is known for working, and again, this is based on Mandiant numbers, but I think you could correlate it with other reports, say from Horizon or others that show broadly the same types of trends. Uh, when the number was first introduced in 2011, you were driven almost exclusively by external notifications. So that was an example of, say, the uh, FBI's notification program saying, hey, uh, you've got an intruder, you need to do something about it versus only 6% of organizations finding that they had a severe intruder on their own. So over time, you wanted to see more and more internal detections and fewer and fewer, fewer, fewer external detections, because the internal was generally faster than the uh, um, external notifications. But again, some of you might be saying, well, wait a second, didn't something happen in the last few years that would cause a lot more internal detections and not in a good way? Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. This is where we get to that, ransomware. So if you think about uh, dwell time decreasing and internal notifications increasing, what is a bad thing that could happen that would cause those numbers to appear to look good when they're really not good? That is ransomware. Because a ransomware case means that at some point, the intruder tells you that they are in your environment and they're now extorting you for millions of dollars. So that's not a good thing. Um, the previous types of cases that, that Mandiant was working were generally some type of espionage case, or if not an espionage case, it was some type of financial crime case where an intruder had long-term access and was stealing data that could be monetized, whether directly monetized as say credit card numbers or PII, uh, or some type of intellectual property versus you know, a straight up espionage case where they just stole for the benefit of their, their patron governments. So. You can see here that for ransomware investigations, you only have a five-day median for dwell time versus the non-ransomware investigations, it was uh, 45 days. So even though in 2020, the median dwell time was down to 24 days, which seems on the face of it, yay, that's great. The, the problem with that was for non-ransomware investigations, it was 45 and for ransomware, it was five. So ransomware has been a scourge of the last few years that is just, uh, it's caused me to just sort of rethink the whole way we approach security. I'm not gonna get into that because I've been pretty public about that and I wanna stay more focused on Zeek and, uh, and the network security monitoring community. But if there are questions at the end, I'd be happy to talk about that as well. Okay, with that, I wanted to, to transition a little bit into um, something for the network security monitoring crowd. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the four types of network security monitoring data and give some examples of how that appears in uh, Zeek and related data. Uh, there's a blog post at the bottom if you're interested in that. And the book covers that I list here are books that I've, I've either published or been included in 
Uh, for example, the fourth edition of Hacking Exposed that came out when I was a consultant at Foundstone, that was the first to feature something that I had written and was printed as a case study. So over the years, my definitions of what the four types of NSM data have changed a little bit. And I know that other people have ideas of what NSM is um, and what the data types are. So I'm just presenting this as this is the way I think about it. And uh, those four types of data are full content, usually abbreviated as PCAP, because that's the dominant um, storage format or capture format as well. Um, transaction logs, extracted content, and then some type of IDS alert or a judgment. So what do those look like? What are we talking about here? Well, full content data is pretty obvious. Um, and I tried to use the same event for all of the examples that I'll be showing here so we can sort of trace it through. Um, a few weeks ago, I went to the Wireshark conference called SharkFest. And so it was interesting to see people who approach pretty much every problem using Wireshark, uh, whereas um, that is not how the Zika community approaches it. Uh, that just shows sort of a different way to, the, to approach the problem. Um, but I do believe that all of these tools work together and I'll be even showing an example from Suricata in a moment. But so clearly if you have full content data and it's unencrypted, you can see quite a bit. Um, however, to represent what we're talking about here, you have potentially thousands of packets. And I think in this, yeah, I've got 2296 packets involved with a single TCP HTTP connection. Uh, not the most efficient way to represent what's happening. However, if you do want to extract the content of this, you have it all available to you. Now, clearly there has to be a different way to more efficiently represent this information because someone who is doing a security analysis job or a network analysis job probably doesn't need to see every packet. They probably wanna know something about the data, about the transaction, who was involved, when did it occur, how much data was transferred, those sorts of questions. And that's where we can turn to something like transaction logs. And I would argue that Zeek is the number one producer of transaction logs. Um, another term you might hear associated with this is session logs, but I think of session logs as being more aligned with layers three and four of the OSI model. So I reserve the term transaction logs to talk about the full panoply of what Zeek can produce versus say a session log would be more like the con log. And speaking of the con log, here's an example of the con log associated with that full content that we just looked at. And I've highlighted the UID, which I think everyone who's involved with Zeek knows is one of the great, uh, I would say, genius decisions that Vern made early on in the development of Zeek because it allows so much rich data science to be, to be done before even anyone even knew what data science was. Uh, so here we have an example of, of a con log. Now, the thing that is, or the concept that is tough for non-Zeek people to understand, I think, and I must say, I don't mean non-Zeek people, because there are people in other communities, like the Suricata community, for example, who get this, but people who are outside of sort of this deep analysis of network traffic, they don't necessarily get that there are other logs that you can create that you can extract really valuable data without having to save every packet. So here's an example of the HTTP.log. This has the same UID because it's linked to that original con log, but then various important bits of information have been extracted. So for example, you have the host, you have the URI, you have the user agent, and not only is this representing the source of the, of the conversation, you have the destination represented as well in a single log entry. So you have your status code 200 OK, indicating that the server was able to respond to this request in a positive manner. Now, again, Zeek doesn't stop here with these sorts of transaction logs. Because um, Zeek recognizes that a file is being transferred, it creates a files.log entry. And this is where some more magic happens. So you have a, a same con uh, ID that was created for the connection and then re reproduced in the HTTP.log. It appears here in the files.log. And because, uh, well, in addition to that, there's a file UID that gets created. So this file here, this entry in the files.log ends up being the glue between one set of Zeek logs and another set that will appear later that we'll, we'll take a look at the next slide. Um, we can also see here that I've configured this, well, actually I didn't configure it. I'm using, uh, I'll admit here, I'm using uh, Seth Hall's CoreLight soft sensor to do this because it just makes things so much easier. But you can see that the uh, file has been extracted and it's been saved to disk. So this is what one of the wonders of the, the files.log is. 
Now, because we have this file UID, I'm able to use that now to search for other types of logs associated with this particular transaction. And in this case, we have a PE.log. So this is a portable executable log that Z can produce once it identifies that the file that was transferred was a Windows portable executable. And we get some information about it, like the OS and the subsystem and it's 64 bit and all that sort of stuff, which again, this is great stuff if you're trying to do any type of uh, network security analysis. So we've looked at the full PCAP and we've looked at the transaction logs. Now let's look at extracted content. So the idea of extracted content, this is the third type of NSM data. This is the idea of ripping just the, the data that is of interest from a, uh, a, a conversation. So you don't get, you, know, you get rid of all the headers and all that kind of junk, and you're just looking at whatever was transferred. The cleanest example of this that you could, have, you could find would be an executable, for example, transferred over FTP uh, data channel. But here we have an executable that's transferred over HTTP, and Zeke is smart enough, and Surcot is able to do this as well, uh, Zeke is smart enough to, to pull this out, and it saved it for me um, with the name of a hash.exe. And I just go through and show how, uh, you know, I do a, a hash against it. You can see the beginning if I do uh, just do a, a hex dump of the executable, the first, uh, you know, few lines of it, you can see that it has the MZ header, and uh, this program cannot be run in DOS mode and so forth. And then finally, and this is where the real power, I think, of the extracting, extraction of files can, can appear, I run it using the, the uh, virus total command line to run it against the hash of this executable. I could also upload the executable if I was interested, but this gives you access to all of the power that's inherent in virus total. Uh, and this is where Zeke could become the pipeline or the originator for a whole bunch of analysis that's done on file tools like uh, Strelka and these other uh, wonderful contributions that we've had over the years. And then finally, the fourth type of NSM data we have available is uh, IDS alerts. Uh, this is an example from Suricata. I could have also done something perhaps from the notice log or the weird log, or maybe perhaps something from Bazaar uh, out of the Zeke world. But here I wanted to um, show how you can link Suricata with the Zeek ecosystem. Uh, again, this has been created by the Corelight soft sensor, but uh, that's why it's in basically Zeek format with all the nice JSON here. But the cool thing about this is, is that um, it's using the community ID, which is a way you can link different types of uh, sources of NSM data. So if I were to go back and find the community ID from the con log, we would see that it's the same here. Um, and we have, uh, Suricata has created two alerts based on what it saw. This is a single connection because you can track the source IP and the source port, dust IP, dust port. And you can see that it uh, served an attached HTTP and also there was just a EXE or DLL file download. So both, both of these were fired. Incidentally, you may be wondering, why didn't it just fire one alert? Uh, is one alert good enough? Uh, this was an early evasion system or evasion method that was discovered very early, like the, the late 90s, like 1999 or so with Snort, where people would trigger a benign alert first, and then all of the subsequent more malicious alerts would be suppressed. And uh, Marty Rush realized that was a, not a good design decision because analysts would ignore the benign alert and uh, the more suspicious or malicious alerts would never be seen. So he made the decision that, okay, we need to, everything that gets triggered, let's go ahead and see it and Suricata implements this as well so that you get the full, uh, the full set of alerts. Okay, let's talk to, just for a minute about the, the different natures of NSM. I, I bring this up because this is the answer that I have to people who wonder about whether NSM is applicable in an age of, of encryption. So what I'm gonna show you is a way to think about this problem that hopefully will help you know, resolve that problem. So the first type of, or the first nature of NSM, I, can, I call here type one, and uh, the idea here is that you're using NSM data to find systems uh, that exhibit suspicious or malicious behavior. So if you think about the millions potentially of systems or hundreds of thousands, or I don't know, you know whatever your scope is, I've worked in, in certs that had you know, a million uh, entities under management. And so you needed a way to go from that giant universe of all the systems and assets that you're responsible for. How do I spend my next eight hours on shift? You know, what is it I should focus upon? And that's where type one NSM can help. Uh, maybe it's driven by some type of alert or notice mechanism, or potentially you could even do a threat hunt to try to find these sorts of things. But the goal is to go from the giant 
universe of all the systems that you that you worry about down to a set of systems that are worth investigating. And maybe the NSM data isn't rich enough to determine exactly what's happening with those systems, but, and this is what's crucial, you could pivot from that small set of systems and in, investigate using, say, an endpoint detection and response product. And that's the value, I would say, the primary value of type one NSM data. You can also use it to solve perhaps very, very simple questions like, or not even very simple, but just you know, more straightforward questions like, was this system active at this time? To which systems did this system communicate? Um, did this system attempt to resolve a certain IP address or domain name or, or whatever? Those are the types of things you can do with type one NSM. Now type two NSM is when you can uh, describe general patterns of activity. So for example, when was the system active? How active was it? What was the general nature of that activity? Um, which um, systems communicated with the potentially compromised asset. And this is where you get a lot of good uh, transaction log data. So for example, uh, where type one NSM might say, yeah, I saw communication between host A and host B. With type two NSM, you might be able to say, it looks like they transferred a file using SMB. Now we don't have the file uh, stored because we didn't extract it perhaps, um, but we do have maybe the name of the file or we have the commands that were run in order to get that file or you know, that sort of more granular information. So it can describe more general pa patterns of activity. Um, you may not have the exact details of what occurred, um, but you know, so for example, you might be able to say there was an SSH connection and uh, it was an interactive session because we were able to tell that somebody was typing on keyboard versus a small file was transferred over an, an encrypted session. And then finally, we have uh, NSM type three. Uh, the, the nature of this type of activity is what some of us who are much older, like myself, um, this is what we grew up with. This was nothing is encrypted or hardly anything's encrypted. If you're simply in the right place and you're collecting the right data, you can see everything. So th these were the days where intruders would run clear text communications. I could see every keystroke. I knew exactly what was happening on a victim system. Um, I could tell you exactly what happened using this type of, of data. Uh, and this is where, for example, having full content data could be extremely valuable because you'd have everything that was passed or if you simply needed to extract a file that had the relevant information. So if you think about it in these different natures, the type three, type two, and type one, what we're seeing is the erosion of type three because of encryption and the, the fallback onto type two and type one. Now, ultimately, I would like to sort of, if we could try to hold the line at type two. And I think there's a lot of research that, that companies like Corelight and others are doing that help make type two NSM um, possible and viable. But remember, at the end of the day, uh, this is a holistic approach. No one should be trying to solve all their problems with network data, just as no one should be trying to solve all their problems with endpoint data. The two of them should work together, in addition to the other two forms of data you can use to figure out what's happening, namely human data, so third parties or your peers or someone telling you what they think is happening, and also infrastructure or logs, like you might get from the cloud or your infrastructure devices or, or those sorts of systems. Okay. I wanted to spend a few minutes now talking about uh, or some advice for people who, who uh, create interfaces to NSM data. And if you haven't heard this before, I hope it will help because it hasn't changed in 25 years and we still have interfaces that are not delivering what I think they could. So the first place to start would be to look at a paper called The Eyes Have It uh, by Ben Schneiderman. Uh, written in 1996, and it's online, and you can download it using that link, or you can just Google for it. The three uh, items of his visual information seeking mantra should be tattooed on the keyboard hands of anyone who is designing an interface. They are overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand. And Mr. Schneiderman uh, wrote them in his paper, and I did a little screen capture there, as you can see, because he he wrote that he wrote one example of that for every time he had forgotten this when working on an interface, and then he had to remind himself when he, of, of relearning this nature. So clearly we have plenty of people working in the interface field who I think are in a similar situation. So let's see if we can shortcut some of that and describe what it is that, that he's talking about. Now, I'm going to show you an interface that demonstrates this uh, pretty well. And it's one that I'm very proud to have been associated with. 
uh, if only to recommend what colors appeared where, uh, and also to be the first analyst who was not a developer to use this sort of thing. Uh, and the idea here, let's go through those three steps. So first is, is, is an overview. And in this interface, uh, and if you sort of look around, you can see the year uh, up there. Um, this isn't even the oldest version of it. This is just the, the best screenshots I could find that were old. Um, the idea is that you're getting an overview of, of a set of activity. And from that overview, you can then zoom and filter. So you can pick something of interest and you can say, I want to know more about that. So here I have an example of zooming and filtering. And then after the zooming and filtering, you get details on demand. And here's an example of, it's not the con log, but it looks a lot like uh, what you'd find in a con log of uh, date and timestamps and source IPs and ports and packets and bytes that were transferred and, and, and the like. Uh, and another form of detail on demand that you can pivot from in this interface would be a packet capture. And uh, yes, this is an ethereal uh, screenshot because <laughs> that's what was around back then uh, when this interface was, was first created. So this idea of overview first, zoom and filter, details on demand is what I would hope interface designers are trying to deliver to the analyst because this is what we need. Uh, this is the type of workflow that a person does or a person follows when they're trying to investigate a security event. Now, in contrast to that, I'm going to illustrate another point, and I'm also going to show how a lot of interfaces do not do this. So I did a Google query search uh, for images for SIM, and this was the first result I got. So I'm, not, I'm trying not to be, you know, attack anyone in particular. Uh, I did black out um, who this is. I think there's no identifying data on it. But what do we have when we look at something like this? Well, I will tell you. Uh, this dashboard says virtually nothing. The, the top half of it is basically who cares information. Um, I really don't care about anything that I see in the, in the top half. The bottom half is, well, it, I'll just say this. If you're using a pie chart, it's worthless. Pie charts tell you nothing. Um, what a pie chart does is force you to try to figure out what the original percentages were. So in every time you see a pie chart, it should be replaced with a table. Because at least if you have a table, you have the items that are of interest and you have the actual numbers associated with them. Visual depictions of this do no one any good. And I don't want to hear that, oh, my, my business manager is not smart. They can't look at... They are smart people. Believe me, I have worked with them. I have testified to Congress. These are all smart people who can understand what a table is. They don't need to see things in a pie chart because for some reason they're not smart enough to you know, read a table. So this type of interface is not doing anyone any good. Now, why is that? What, what, what is the big problem with, with this interface? It comes down to not only the, the Schneiderman mantra that I mentioned earlier, but also a, a, a topic called data density. And I first learned about this idea from one of the great minds, uh, not even in our field, just period, as far as I'm concerned, a gentleman named Edward Tufte. And he's written a series of books. I think there's five of them at this point. This was uh, this, this is one of the books, The Visual Display of Quantitative Information, and I quote here from the second edition, published in 2001. So he is an expert in display of information, and he talks about this idea of data density being a, a ratio of the number of entries uh, in a data matrix versus the area of the data graphic, which essentially can be reduced to a words per inch or per centimeter or something, um, or a, a numbers per inch. So you can literally calculate how much information you're displaying to someone who is trying to take, take this in. So for example, he, uh, these are a couple pages from his, his second edition book there. I think you can pretty clearly see that the, the graphic on the left that is the bar chart, which is again, something we see plenty of times in various presentations, uh, interfaces for analysts, this is a waste of time. Uh, in fact, you can you can calculate how much of a waste of time is it is by um, calculating the data density for it, which is something that uh, Mr. Tu or Dr. Tufty does here. And then he's got a couple of other examples where the data density is much better to the point where an example down here um, for this New York weather history, 
uh, he's calculated the data density to be 28 per square centimeter or 181 numbers per square inch, which is a lot better. Um, so what, this is what's wrong with this SIM interface. Um, it is possible to try to extract some values from the y-axis looking at this. I don't even know what the x-axis is here, which is another problem. But I could potentially try to extract some values from this. But down here, I have to work really hard to figure out what these numbers could be. So for example, yeah, that's a little bit less than 50%. So maybe it's like 47 or something. And this one looks similar. And well, that one's clearly more than, than uh, 25%, but it's not quite. You know, this is why pie charts are a waste of time. Um, in addition to just the data density, right? The, 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 the two thirds of the screen have no numbers at all. So the data density is zero. The data density up here, I'm not sure how I would, you know, you have to try to calculate that, but it just goes to show you that this not only has a lack of the Schneiderman principle, the data density is essentially, you know, almost non-existent. However, if we compare both the Schneiderman principle and the data density with what we saw earlier with this interface, which I will tell you if you're not familiar with it, this is the squeal interface that BAM, the BAM Vischer created in 2001, I believe, or maybe 2000. First is Sprague and later on it became squeal. Um, the, the, I, I, the data density for this is incredible. It means almost all numbers, basically. And the same thing is true, incidentally, of the old ethereal and then you know, later on the Wireshark interfaces. You know, assuming you, you size the screen properly, the data density is immense. So these are just a couple of principles I would hope uh, people would keep in mind when they're working on their, their interfaces. So if this is at all intrigued you, um, please check out Dr. Tufty's books. You can take his class. Um, you can do it online or in person. It will change your life if you're involved in any type of data manipulation, display, presentations. I get nothing from this. I just went to his class twice and it uh, blew my mind each time. So finally, I'd like to end just with a warning um, to, to everyone um, to take care of yourself. Um, clearly, we've been in a difficult situation for the last year and a half due to the pandemic. Uh, but even prior to that, I, one thing I had noticed in our community, the security world, or just probably the IT world in general, is that burnout is real. And I dealt with this myself, and I documented it um, about th almost three years ago now in a blog post, a security blog, where I went through a real real serious uh, burnout. And I left security. I left IT basically for a year. I did a little consulting, but for the most part, I, I thought I was done. I came back um, when Seth Hall said, why don't you come work at Corelight? And so I thought, wow, that would be great. I didn't even think about that. And I've been happy here ever since. But burnout is real. And uh, I'm not an expert in how to handle this. I could just have my own story there. But uh, you know, I would encourage you to think about that and to uh, take care of yourself and to try to you know, take care of others as well. Finally, just a little plug here for Zeek in Action. If you haven't checked out our videos, please do. Uh, we have new ones coming out all the time. And the idea with Zeek in Action is just to show what you can do with Zeek, uh, common problems that you might encounter, and to do it in a way that sort of communicates in uh, a different form, you know, something that's a video. Uh, I do a lot of watching videos when I'm like eating a meal or, you know, lunchtime or something like that. So uh, Zeek in Action is produced with that sort of beginner's mind, and I hope uh, you find it useful. And then finally, um, I spent the first year of the pandemic turning what my favorite blog entries uh, from DAS Security Blog into a series of four books. And if you would be interested in any of those, they're all available uh, at Amazon. You can get Kindle or print editions, uh, and all the details are at DASSecurity.com. OK, and with that, uh, I hope you enjoy day three of Zeek Week. Again, I'd like to thank uh, Amber and the LT for the opportunity to speak. And I think there might be a couple minutes for questions because I think this is supposed to end at 1240. Um, so with that, I uh, will turn it back over to Amber. Thanks, Richard. That was a great keynote and a great way to start day three. I think there has been a little bit of conversation in the day one and day two uh, talk tracks because people heard our, our behind the scenes conversation. Um, and um, they've just been making comments. So if you, can you see the, uh, Slack channels. Let me Maybe. look here. Let's see. Okay. Oh my goodness. Yes. Look at that pie chart. Oh my <laughs> God. That's terrible. This is terrible. Uh -oh. 
I, I, that is right. That's right, Smoot. That is the ex- prototypical. Uh, I actually I follow a, a Twitter account that does tweet nothing but bad DoD slides, and this would the, this is the type of slide you would see on a DoD uh, DoD slide. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate it. Yep, Smoot's right. Just replace it with a list. Just replace it with a table. One of the points that Dr. Tufty makes is that uh, people who you assume are not smart because they're in management must like to look at pie charts for some reason, and yet those same people are very easily able to consume multiple business metrics listed as, you know, if you think about the types of metrics that are associated with stocks or P, uh, P&L statements or any of that, those are all tables, and they chew through those like nothing. So you don't need to somehow make it digestible for people to be in a pie chart. There's no need. Just provide a table. Oh, and Seth, yes, you do have to do some pie chart soul searching. There is never, there's never a reason to have a pie chart. Never. Just provide a table. Everyone will love you for it. What else do we have here? Richard, I have to say I, I really appreciated your little uh, hint at the end there to take care of yourself. Burnout is really real. I mean, um, I, I experienced that not too many years ago, and it create, I created a talk called, uh, what was it, uh, holi- uh, no, something about uh, volunteer vertigo and high-tech hangovers, just because mm-hmm. you, you don't realize, even when you're a volunteer, that you are subject to burnout as well. So thank you so much for reminding people uh, to take care of themselves as, as we come out of this pandemic. Yeah, I, I got a lot of private communication when I put out that blog post. People who had stories like mine, stories that were much more significant, you know, serious problems that people had, and uh, especially in security, right? Security, oh, no one is making it easy these days. And that's one of the things I like about the Zeke world is that we are pretty unabashedly defensive. It is theoretically possible to leverage what we do for nefarious monitoring purposes. I mean, I guess you could, if you were like a third world dictator, you could potentially deploy Zeke and monitor your users. But generally, that is not something you hear happening. Whereas if you are dropping POCs on GitHub and someone is using them that day to break into someone's phone and to harass them or to stalk them or whatever, you know, we don't have anything to do with that. So that's one of the things I like about the Zeke world is that we... Uh, we're a little bit more on the on the good side, but let's see. What else do we have here? I agree about pie charts. Some of my bosses did not. So I put a pie chart with a table under it. That's good. Actually, yeah. That way you just avoid the table. I'm sorry, you avoid the pie chart and you have the data in the table. Um, yeah, good comments. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Greg noted that it turns out that Seth came up with the connection ID. See the day one Slack. So, wow, congratulations to Seth for coming up with the connection ID. That's one of the, uh, I don't know, maybe, I hope I hope people recognize how important that is. I, w- I wouldn't say it's an unsung hero of security, but it's probably one of the best decisions that could have been made. Um, so yeah, that's one of the things that was always impressed me about the Zeek project is that there's been thoughtful development that makes a lot of other things easy. Now, now, that's not to say Zeke doesn't have one of the toughest learning curves available, particularly if you want to be a developer. But as far as being an analyst, uh, the data is so rich and so thoughtfully constructed that it is, uh, you know, it's a joy to work with. I think Robin is in the room now, so we'll get ready for his, his, his talk after yours and say thank you so much, Richard, again for keynoting. And I'm sure folks would love to pick your brain a little bit more in the Slack channel um, as uh, it, it looks like more comments are, are coming in. So I'll, I'll let you go talk to the folks in Slack and we'll bring Robin in uh, to give his talk. So All right. Thank you. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody.